Okay, what I've shown you so far, you can do with any simulation program, Vizim, Simulac, Stellar, and so on. What I want to do now is show what you can do with those programs, which is incredibly complicated, but very straightforward with Minsky, courtesy of the bank icon we've brought in, which brings in a double-entry bookkeeping way of generating the equations that run a dynamic simulation program uh, like Vizim, Simulac, and so on. Now, there's the bank icon, the same way as you create anything else uh, in the system. You click on the icon up in the palette here and drag it down and place it somewhere. As you can see, we can have more than one bank in the system, but I'll just uh, right-click and choose Delete and just have this one bank icon here. Now, if you right-click and choose Open the Godly Table, or you double-click, you then get this tabular view of the accounts of the economy from the point of view of the bank you're looking at right now. Of course, there can be a central bank, a private bank, non-banks, etc., etc., as you put an entire complex model of the financial system together. This is just going to be looking as though there's just a single banking sector at a national economy, and I'm going to show the basic ideas behind endogenous money at the same time. Of course, this leaves out an enormous amount of complexity of the actual financial system, but this is just to illustrate both the modeling capabilities of Minsky with when you do a look at a financial system and also show uh, how why endogenous money makes a large, such a large difference to how we think about how the economy operates. Right, so you can see we have over here in the left-hand corner, I can turn off double entry. That is to make it easier in some times to build a, a, a simple dynamic model from the top down. That's how I first started doing the modeling. I now pretty much insist on using double entry bookkeeping because it really does clarify what the financial structure of an economy is like. So the double entry bookkeeping, uh, first of all, you need to classify whether you are looking, whether the accounts you're looking at are an asset for the bank, in which case they're shown as a positive, a liability for the bank, in which case they're shown as a negative, and the equity is also shown as a negative. And this enables us to do the balancing to make sure that transfers from one account to another or creation of loan in one place is matched by creation and deposit in another, and you get that balance. It's very, very hard to define in a flowchart system, quite easy to define this way. So let's just look at a very simple system where there are only loans by the banking sector to the firm sector. Now, as I move my cursor away from here, you'll now see the word loans turns up as an uh, output from the godly table. If I now click on the plus key here, I can create another column, and I'll make this a liability and I'll call this firms, standing for the firm sector. Move the mouse a bit, and you'll see that firms now pops up as another account in the system, a system state from a dynamic modeler's point of view. Let's now add one more liability, which I'll call workers, or the accounts of the workers in the, in the economy. And finally, an equity, which I'll call safe, the bank's safe. Now, notice there are initial conditions. As apply in all dynamic systems, you must supply initial conditions for differential equations, which are what are being generated by the system here. Now, let's say the initial loan is $100 million or $100 billion by the banking sector to the firm sector. Notice it currently has a reverse sum of, of, of uh, 100 over here. This has to balance to zero like everything else in the system, as you'll see in a moment. So that now shows you the row sum of the initial conditions are consistent with each other. Now we need to have the financial operations. Well, I'm going to make a very, very simple model here where there are simply new loans by the banking system to the uh, firm sector. And I now provide a, a, a label for this. I'll call this lending. And over here, I've got to balance this by minus lending, which effectively says the loans are created here and the deposits are all simultaneously created in the accounts of the firm sector. Notice now we have lending as an input to the godly table on the right-hand side. And again, we're making sure the row sum is zero. Now, once you have loans, you have to service them. And that is a case of paying interest. And again, this is a very simple way of showing it. It'd be much more complex than actual bank accounts. Interest payment from here to here. And again, the program is making sure I'm using the same label uh, for the different uh, for the same operation in different accounts. Now, the reason for borrowing the money is to hire workers, which means you've got to pay a wage or pay wages. Let's use the plural here. Wages are transferred from that one liability account, which is the firm sector, to the workers over there. 
and then what you then have is simple consumption. So workers consume, and I'll call this cons just for a shorthand cons underscore w. And over here, that there's, there's money that is transferred from the workers to the firm sector. Similar thing for bankers. Of course, this would be intermediate good purchases as well, but just call it consumption for now. So this is the from or the source. This is the sink. And I've now got a simple system. Um, just to make it faster to finish it, I'll leave it at that and come back to it uh, later. Now you can see I've got five operations coming in here into four accounts. And at this level of complexity, I have to base what happens in one um, account on the dynamics with the other accounts. I'm not going to be including feedback from the physical economy uh, just yet, though of course that is what you can do when you combine this approach to modeling with the flowchart approach to modeling you can use using these icons up the top here. So let's just now go and define each of those elements in the godly table. So um, the most obvious one to define is interest. Now just to illustrate, you can define this by attaching stuff to the godly table as well, but it's neater, I think, to move it uh, aside somewhat. So if I wanted to define interest on loans, that obviously is going to be the rate of interest multiplied by what's currently in the, in the loans here. So um, I'll right-click and I'll choose copy, and I get a copy of that variable over here. And here's interest. Now I could wire it up directly to here, but I think it's needed to say, well, let's grab that variable, copy of that or that flow. We're now going to say the flow of interest depends upon the amount of money in loans multiplied by the rate of interest. So I'll just call this R underscore L, rate of interest of loan. Let's say that's 5% or 0 0.05. And I simply need to multiply the rate of interest on loans by the amount in loans, and I've now defined what the interest flows are. Now, wages, I'll make wages a function of the amount of money turning over in the firm's deposit accounts. So, again, making this very simply, I'll take a copy of the firms over here. And let's say there's some rate at which this money turns over. I normally use a um, a time constant if I was doing a more serious model, but just to do a very fast one, I'll say that, let's say this thing, we will call this a constant W, and say that the firm, the balance in the firm's account turns over three times a year uh, in the payment of wages. So you then multiply those two together, wire that up, and I've defined wages. Now lending, let's go back to that, a copy of lending, bring this up here, and I'll base lending as being an exponential growth of the level of loans that currently exist. Of course, it's much more complicated in a realistic model, but just to show how it's done. Well, let's say the rate of growth of loans is, uh, say, 10% uh, per annum. A bit higher than you actually want it to be, but pretty similar to what it has been, uh, given the Ponzi scheme economy we have been living in for the last 30 years. Okay, so that's going to be the growth of loans. Now consumption by workers. I will use a time constant here, just because some people get confused when they see me using a large number here. Uh, so I'm going to say there's some rate at which workers spend their accounts, and I'll call this tau using the Greek uh, letter for, uh, for, for, t for time, and I'll give it a value of 0 0.04, which is close to um, 125th of, well, 125th of the year. This is saying workers' accounts uh, would be, if they didn't get any more money into them, they'd be emptied after, after 125th of a year or roughly a fortnight. So what I now do is divide the workers' account by that time constant. They're saying, in effect, they're saying workers turn over their accounts about 25 times a year. And that shows two things. There's more of them have got less money in those accounts. They've got to spend the money more rapidly. Now, bankers, who are somewhat wealthier, have a much lower time constant. So I just have to have the SAP as an input here and say there's some rate of consumption by workers as, uh, bankers as well, which I'll call tau BC, and I'll say that they turn over their accounts about once a year. 
Again, the same story. Divide that into, and that is now going to define consumption by bankers. So having done all that, and wiring up this last element, I should now be able to graph a few things of interest here. Well, I'm saying what wages payments are, that's something you'd actually like to know what's going on. Let's graph wages. And let's also graph, let's move the table over, for, make a bit of space here. Let's now also graph the amount of money that's existing in loans and the amount in the firm's deposit account and do the same down here for the amount in the safe and the amount in workers' accounts. Graph that as well over here and wire this up and see what happens. And what you've got is exponential growth in the amount of money in the economy, growth in wages, etc., etc. Quite simple, really. Uh, this is the basic point of endogenous money modeling. But that was a very, very simple model to put together very, very quickly. Uh, I will have a crack maybe later on in doing the Kickstarter camera to showing what this would look like coded up in VizSim and so on, and how easy it is to make a mistake there, where in this case, with the double entry bookkeeping, making sure all your sums sum to the same amount, that you don't make any errors in your. Um, combining of the different system states to represent a financial system. So that's the real guts of what Minsk is about. That's why uh, we're designing it. That's why we need your help to take it beyond the level of doing a simple model like this to modeling the entire financial system.